things that I'm afraid of. And uh, I don't know if I'm afraid of a whole lot of things. I'm sure that you have different fears and maybe I do. One fear that I have, though, is failure. As a man, I think that's a common fear that men have. And so we try to, to cover it up sometimes. We try to be tough. We try to do things. We try to make money. We try to do things that we show that we'd be successful at so we won't be a failure and people won't notice. You know? I don't know what ladies are afraid of, but I am considered concerned about failure. Fathers have big jobs. You know, we can get successful, I think, of famous people. There are great successful people. They do big things in the world and they're famous and people think they're great. And then you find out that their sons hate their guts. That song makes me think of that. You know, the Bible doesn't have a whole lot of instructions about how to be a father. The more I thought about it and looked, it doesn't have pages of saying, now you want to be a good father, do this, this, and this, and this. It doesn't talk about it like much. And yet, God makes you understand that parenting and fatherhood is so important. And I'm thinking, Lord, how can that be that if it's so important that you don't give us manuals of instructions of how to do it right? I found this writing from this guy from Promise Keepers that I thought was significant in fatherhood. It kind of says, says it in a fun way what I'm talking about. Um, it says, after 19 years of being honored on Father's Day, I finally, I'm finally getting the hang of it. Fatherhood is a great job which I wouldn't want to trade with mom. Having seen motherhood and all that comes with it, I'll take fathering any day. Here's why. Fatherhood is being thrilled with whatever they get for you on your big day. Father's Day, as it was celebrated in my youth, brings back memories of Old Spice, aftershave, and soap on a rope. Other fine gifts given and received on Father's Day include hedge cutters, weed trimmers, and plumbing snakes. When will the families of America realize that a dad on Father's Day does not want to be pointed in the direction of manual labor? Moms do not permit Mother's Day to be run like this, yet we fathers are to be thrilled with whatever they get us. Fatherhood is getting excited with whatever mom gives birth to. The act of becoming a father has changed significantly since I was born. Back then, the dad-to-be was told all he could do was pace about the waiting room, or he was not, if he was not the nervous type, he could read about walleye fishing from three-year-old copies of Field and Stream. Now dad is expected to participate in the blessed event. Today's dads even bring video cameras into the birthing room to record baby's debut. Whether or not the average guy really enjoys the process may never be known. But one thing is certain, fathers will always go gaga over the beautiful new life even if it does resemble an oval-headed frog with its body dipped in lemon lime yogurt. (laughs) Fatherhood is losing patience with kids who are just being kids. Mom certainly has the tougher job, but mothers have at least one big advantage over fathers. I think motherhood is largely instinctive, whereas most men don't have a clue what they're walking into. Who of us are known or know anything about handling children before the offspring themselves arrive? We're not prepared when at 3 a.m. a tiny person in the newly walled, papered room down the hall starts screaming for no apparent reason. We were not prepared when this little critter started crawling around putting paper clips and cat food in his mouth. No one told me that to do with... To do with two bored kids scuffling like cats in the car's back seat. Dad, she's on my side of the seat. Stop hitting your sister. No, she's hit me first. While the family enjoys, well, endures a long vacation trip. Let me have one of those. I've had a few of those. Fatherhood is like on-the-job training. In the military, we call it OJT. That is, on-the-job training. Makes sense. Wouldn't be nice if upon learning of our impending fatherhood, we could have picked up... 430 books, which are published in the last six months about parenting, sleep on it and thereby become great fathers overnight simply by osmosis. However, fatherhood like the military isn't learned that way. Most of our education will be OJT. Fatherhood is holding close and letting go. The aspect of OJT and fatherhood that I've recently entered into could be entitled letting go. 
Some authority on children once said, hold them very close and then let them go. This is the hardest truth for any father and mother to learn, in fact. The real miracle of fathering is not that adults produce children, but that children produce adults. Our kids are continuously growing up, becoming more adult, and moving away from us until, of course, they move back in. Fatherhood is loving their mother. It's also changing the diapers, fixing the broken toy, and admiring refrigerator art. Fatherhood is applying training wheels, giving wings to graduates, and giving away the bride at weddings. Fatherhood means listening to their stories over and over, reading their favorite bedtime and Bible stories, telling them stories of the good old days, theirs and ours. We even make up stories as we go along just to tease them. We fathers love to rock and wrestle, tease and tickle. Fatherhood is being a promise keeper. That means providing bread on the table, food for thought, and hope for the future. Fatherhood means understanding their hurts and humoring their peculiar traits. Fathers cheer and coach their soccer, hockey, gymnastics, softball, football, basketball, oh, I guess I can quit there, and don't forget their ballet performances, band concerts, and piano recitals. How could we? Fatherhood is being there, being strong, being... Most of all, a promise keeper. If done right, fatherhood is a lot like work, only more rewarding. Happy Father's Day. You know, I think in terms of those words, and I think a lot of that kind of sums up, I think, what God's after and what we sung this song about. Just want to be there. You know, my boys could care less if I fail. In work, they could care less if I fail in life. But they want to be there. They want somebody who loves them, listens to them, hugs them, cares for them, is their friend, guides them along, cares for them. I'm all afraid of failing. So I work harder and harder and spend more time away from them trying to do my job or whatever. And kids just want a dad that loves them. And I start understanding scripture too. God doesn't give you all these rules and regulations. He wants you to love people. He loves people. He cares for people. You've got to give them time and effort. You've got to be with them. Be somebody with them. And it doesn't take a famous father. It doesn't take some great person who's had a formal degree in fatherhood from the university. So it makes you such a good daddy. So God skipped all the fancy words with it and told you to love your kids and show them what's right. And I think the biggest key is not all the talk. It's what you do. And so I learned from Scripture about David. He was the most famous king of Israel. One of the biggest guys. He was known and has been famous all these years. They make movies still about him even in Hollywood, which is amazing because Hollywood doesn't care about God too much, but they even make movies about David. His fame has stood for thousands of years. And God did greatly use this man in Israel. And it says that he had a heart like after God, and so God responded to him. And poured out his life into him and did great and mighty things through him. He's the guy that was so famous, he was a dumb kid who went out and took a stone and killed a giant. When the guy was all armed to the teeth for warfare. I mean, he wasn't too bright, it seems like. He was runs in front of a guy and throws a stone at him and kills him. But in God's faithfulness, he blessed David, and David, through his faith in God, did great exploits. But you know, that guy ended up doing a lot of things wrong. One day, as a king who knew better, they didn't have television to watch, and they didn't have porno movies to watch, so he gets on his roof instead, and watches his neighbor take a bath, and starts to get hungry for the wrong things. And using his power, misusing his power because he's king and ultimate ruler, he decides he wants that woman he's watched and sins for her and makes her come over to his palace, commits sin with her, and then he's in trouble because that 
lady's wife, uh, husband, happened to be a military leader that was faithful to his army. And that man had, would do anything for David. And he was out in battle for him at the time that he goes and steals his wife. Bad show. Then, because he felt guilty, he decided he had to do something. So he calls him home from the war. says, come and be with your wife for a while. Take a break. Because you know what? He got in trouble. He got the woman pregnant. Everybody's going to know his sin. It's kind of hard to hide it when the lady's bulging. And so everybody would know. So go home. Spend a month with your wife. Take a break. I can't do it. I love you, David. And he wouldn't even sleep in the house. He sat outside wanting to go back to show him his love and support. What does that do to a wicked guy like that? He's dying. Trying to get his, get him in there to cover his sin. And the guy's so faithful to him, he sleeps outside his door so he can go back to fight the war for the guy he's, he's supporting. So since it didn't work, he goes and says, fine. And of all things, he sends a message back and says, take him and put him in the front lines. Then leave him there and retreat so he gets killed. Get him out of here. And so he has it. And sure enough, the guy does it. He carries his own message of death back to the commander who sends him into a war and sends him into battle and lets him die. Okay, he covered his mistake. Now he's in trouble. And sure enough, God didn't let it go. A good guy named Nathan comes knocking on his door. I named my son after that guy. He stood for God and said, You've done wrong. And David broke down and knew and admitted he was wrong. And God gave him mercy and forgiveness. So what's this got to do with fatherhood? Well, the next part of the story, his example and his relationship to this whole event triggered a reaction that went on through his life. Because, see, David's other son named Absalom was a young man who also got so reactive to this kind of immorality that the first thing that happened is one of his half-brothers decided that he wanted to do the same thing with his sister. And so he conned away and he raped his half-sister, which was Absalom's full sister. That made him so mad and angry that for two years he schemed and plotted till he murdered his brother to pay him back for this evil against his sister. He followed his dad's footsteps. Now, even worse things happen in that household. Now that he's gone and done that, David is angry. So Absalom runs for his life. Then he ended up trying to steal his kingdom, ended up fighting a war against his own father. They had such destructive murder and fight and wars that thousands were killed, and it turned into a massacre of problems in the kingdom. What am I saying about fatherhood? Famous fathers blow it. Regular dads blow it. People blow it. But there's something that can be learned through this. And David didn't even learn it. God gave David mercy for what he did wrong. And yet he would not even forgive his own son and wouldn't even look at his face. Our failures destroy our children. And as a father, one thing you need to learn is to be an example to your children. Because they will follow what you do. I heard of a story, but I can't remember the exact details because it's been a long time. And I don't remember who it was now. But a man who, who really blew it, turned away from his family. He, he was really struggling and fighting with his wife. Did many things. And it was up in the cold weather because there was snow there. And so he got angry one night and went to the bar and stomped down there and walked down to the bar. And they found, a few hours later, a little boy wandering around in the bar looking for his daddy. And they said, well, who's your daddy? And he couldn't even, he wasn't old enough to even be able to tell him a whole lot, but he, they found him there in the bar, drunk. And that little boy, the reason he got there was because he followed his dad's footsteps through the snow all the way from the house through the cold winter to the bar looking for his daddy. Kids will follow your footprints. No matter what you say and you know is right, they'll still follow your footprints. They still will do what you do. 
And as a father, you must understand the importance of what you do. My failures can be turned into successes if I respond rightly to them. You see what I'm saying? In the same token, they will turn into greater failure to my kids if I'm not careful. And David, if he would have shown mercy to his son Absalom, a whole different history could have been written. But because he wouldn't even look at his son's face because he just remembered the evil he did, he left a hole in history in his family that was so destructive, his sons died. And Absalom was eventually killed through all that. Oh, what failure of a famous man. And we don't want failure in that sense, do we? I don't want failure in that sense. How important it is for me as a father then to realize that it's not a lot of big rules that I have to do to be a successful father. I can be a successful father in spite of my mistakes, in spite of my shortcomings, if I understand the importance of what I do is going to be an impact on my sons and my daughters. I don't have any daughters. I just say sons like those guys do. Sons that will never be shaken from them hardly. And if you don't understand that, you're missing the point. What I do and how I respond to God will say more to my sons than what I try to preach to them all my days with my lips blabbing. How I respond to my wife will say so much more than what I say with my mouth for them that they ought to do with their wives or their whatever when they have wives. And you see the importance of who I am and what I am makes sense there. If I fail in business, who cares? My kids won't mind. And if I fail in other parts of life, my kids could care less. But if I fail with them, I know God cares. So my time and my life are important to my kids. Who I am is important to my kids. And they're the same with you guys, you fathers here today. What you are to your kids is important. And what you are before God is important. When you blow it, you know what? If you're so arrogant, proud that you won't admit it, you teach your children something that's wrong. But when you come to your children or even to your wife publicly and admit you're wrong... That says a whole lot to them. You know that? You know what I'm saying? When you see things happen with your kids, you say, how where did they learn that from? They learned it from you. Did you ever see that commercial on TV of that kid that's had drugs in his bedroom and he's going, why are you doing this? Where did you learn this? And come on, you better tell me now. And the kid finally says, I learned it from you, Dad. You remember that commercial? I learned it from you. What did that guy do? He just kind of... <laughs> There was nothing else to say. Suddenly he swallowed because he didn't realize his son had seen him. He thought he hid it well. He didn't hide anything. But being real and loving do a lot. You don't have to be right on a lot of stuff, but you have to be right on loving and caring and being real. That's what God says. And being a father, to be real and give that time and effort and love and presence. It's a big deal. It's a big deal to that guy right there. He likes Dad holding him up. He's so comfortable, he's zoned out of life right now. Because he's held in peace. And held up there. See how neat that is? He can just zone out. He's not aware of danger. He's not aware. So I laughed. I was at the basketball game last night and... Uh, one of the dads was there taking care of his little boy and uh, he had to take care of his diaper so he did it right there so he pulled his pants off he's bare naked there you know, he's not aware the kid's not aware that he's bare naked in front of everybody on the stands you know he wasn't aware of it didn't bother him didn't even think about it so eventually the day comes when you're aware of it and you don't want your dad and mom doing that kind of stuff around anyway you know but at that point in his life he wasn't aware he was in the hands of love he was comforted. He was cared for. He was cool. And he was taken care of. See, that's what fatherhood is. 
Doesn't have to be all the good, big, fancy stuff. Your kids don't need new cars, new boats, and new stuff. They don't need tons of clothes. They don't need all the stuff that you think you have to work in endless hours for, so that that's the only thing they get. No, they need you. They just want you. That can live a long time and not even worry about it. I mean, think about it. Half the kids take the shoes off as soon as you put them on them in the first place. Obviously, they don't want them. So what do you keep shoving those shoes on them for when they don't care? Why are you so worried about all that stuff? What you need to worry about is their presence and your presence with them. They want you. Hear me? That's a simple message, isn't it? It's a simple message from God. Second Samuel goes through a lot of stuff to show the failure of David. I didn't take the time to go through all the scripture like I usually do. But I want you to see the importance of it. And you can be in the presence of God and show the presence of God to your children. And they'll know God by you. They'll know God by how you act. They'll know God how you live. They'll watch what you do. And they'll know whether you love God. My kids are the worst hypocrite finders in the world for me. They're always reminding me something about, Dad, you said this, but you're like, I don't want to hear it. They know me too well. They see all that stuff. And they can just point the finger and push the button <laughs> till I'm squirming, you know. Ugh. Shut up. And then you can yell at them and tell them to shut up and go to their room and you don't have to think about it for a while, you know. But that's what they do. Would you bow your heads with me for a moment? It's important that you have a relationship with the living God to start all that. And a relationship with God is, is like a relationship with a father and a son. It's the same type. That's why God in the Scripture uses the word, call Him Father, Heavenly Father. They even use the word Abba, which in the, the Aramaic type of speaking of the day just meant Daddy. Daddy, God wants a relationship with you. But He can't just have one because He wants one. It's a, a relationship always two ways, isn't it? And to have a father, you've got to have a son or a kid to make it work. And so it's, it's not just a mental thing, it's a real thing. And I want to just for a moment, while your heads are bowed, and before I just start pray to, to share with you simply how to have a relationship how you can actually have Father, God the Father, be your Father. It's simple, but yet it takes a cost of your commitment. Number one, God does love you, and He wants to be Father to you. But to have that relationship means this. You have to admit to yourself and to God that you didn't want one. Instead, you want to run your life your way, your, your things, do what you want. And to have a relationship with Father means this then. Admitting, and we use the religious word sin, breaking the law, disobedience. I don't want you to be my Father. I don't want to respond to you. I don't want you to run my life. That's sin, breaking God's law. And God says if you admit that it's wrong... Ask me to forgive you. I will give you my kingdom. I will give you my presence forever. I will adopt you as my own kids and you can live with me forever in eternity. That's what it means. It's relationship. Religion's not burning candles, singing certain songs. It's a living relationship with God through Jesus Christ. But because of our sin, this is the other key why it's so important of Jesus. Jesus Christ died on the cross in my place and in yours my disobedience it was so important to God that he gave the death penalty for it and yet in his love he offered you forgiveness by accepting his death in your place that's what we're talking about when we said Jesus died on the cross he suffered the penalty of death for sin my sin and yours and if you receive his forgiveness, his gift, he will adopt you as his own. That's what we call the good news. God is real. He loves you. Jesus died in your place and he will accept you today. 
if you would simply admit it, confess it, and ask His forgiveness. That is the essence of religion, a relationship with God. And so in the moment when I pray, you can do it too in the quietness. No one's looking. No one's listening to you. You can speak in your mind to God. He'll hear you. And you can ask Him to forgive you. You can admit your need for forgiveness and ask Him to take over your life. And if you do that, you will become born again. What we call being a Christian. You will then have a Father, a Heavenly Father. And God loves you. In the quietness of time, if you believe that and need that, I encourage you quietly to pray a prayer similar to this. And then we'll close. Father... Forgive me for my sin. I admit, I do not and have not wanted you to be master of my life. But I know it's wrong. And I ask your forgiveness. Forgive me for being a liar. Forgive me for whatever you can fill in the sins. Cheat. Adulterer. A thief. Whatever things that are there. I admit they're wrong. I ask you to give me life through Jesus. I give my life to you. If you prayed that prayer, that brings you to the kingdom. You can start a new life in Him. Father, I thank you for this day that I've had the opportunity just to share your good news and to enjoy your presence here. We pray that just in a small way the truth of your word will have made a testimony to those here, our visitors, to the guests that have come, and to the people that have come here on a regular basis. I pray, Lord, that in some way, your truth will stick into hearts and change lives like you've changed many of ours here. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.